Welcome to the new season of the Live Your Spa Life Show. The Spa and Spa Life stands for Seek Power Always, that divine power within you to do what you're here to do. The theme for this season is Freedom Fighter. Amazing people like you share ways to ensure your freedom physically, financially, spiritually, and in your relationships to create a world-class life. In these times of uncertainty, it's time for you to move past the distractions and start trusting yourself more through your God-given knowingness. No one truly knows better what's best for you than you. In this season, you'll have plenty of examples of people choosing their best life and giving a voice of freedom to those who are also looking to have their best life. Thank you for sharing your precious time with us and being part of the Live Your Spa Life conversation. With us today is Jen Nash, also known as a connector in chief who helps companies boost their retention rates and people who add more meaning to their lives through connection. That's where they, that really is going to make a difference here. And she is a master facilitator, author, sought after executive coach, and corporate speaker. Jen, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Diane. I'm excited. Well, let's jump in. You and I just recently talked here about retention. Like that is the name of the game happening right now. You know, people are overwhelmed. The last two years are a lot of people feel like it's something they survived and there's a lot of overwhelmed and you're doing a lot of retention focused training. Tell us about, you know, companies that are losing employees like crazy and what they can do about it. Um, I think you're going to love this answer because in all my research, there's one Thing that companies can do support friendship. 61% of employees will turn down a better offer if they have five to seven friends. That data inspires me. So when you take initiative to support a connected culture, a happier culture, you're actually saving your company thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars. Because according to Gallup, we spend about 50% of an employee's salary up to 200% of that employee's salary to literally hire someone and replace them. And that's, you know, uh, other people's time. It's the recruiter's time. It's, you know, lost client income. It's all of that. So it can be really expensive when we don't value our employees. Oh, wow. That is what a great distinction, you know, because, you know, there, there's so many different mindsets about, you know, some people look at companies as, hey, this is family, like we're in this together. There's that teamwork. And then there's others that are like ultra competitive. And, you know, I don't want anyone looking at, my, at what I'm doing. And so the culture that you create uh, really can make a difference on how that lands for people. For sure. And while I think it's wonderful to do leadership training because a great leader inspires, I think it's also really important to check in and see how these left brain geniuses are managing their teams who are now scattered everywhere. There's never that opportunity to like see each other on a weekly basis. You're not running into each other on the elevator or grabbing a quick lunch with the team. Those moments have become... I guess, rarer for most companies, right? So how are we building connection? And I think it's really interesting. A lot of super bright people, they don't have that innately. They are very driven. They're focused on their goals. They are results oriented. And they forget that actually... Asking someone how their wife is healing, asking someone how, you know, their dog is doing post-surgery or checking in after Father's Day, you know, these kinds of things really cement a sense of, oh, this goes beyond the objectives that I'm here to deliver. This person cares about me. And that's really important. Right. Well, you know, that's one aspect to be able to talk to them and, and have this Zoom connection that, that people are having. Uh, but what about that? Like people aren't hanging out around the, the water cooler or they're not going out for drinks on a Friday or, or you know, the things they typically have. Uh, how important is that for people to uh, carve that into their business to actually meet in person? I think 
I think, I mean, you could say it's critical, but at the end of the day, if someone's not comfortable or now, I mean, the really cool thing is companies are hiring amazing people who live all over. You're, you're not going to have, you know, a connection in person with someone who's in Texas if you're in New York, right. but at the same time, making time for walk and talks on the phone where you both set aside 20 minutes and you get up and you leave your computer and you go talk with someone who's maybe on your team or maybe just outside your team, but works in affiliation with what you're trying to achieve. Like those types of connections can cement employees, you know, loyalty to a company. Right. And addition, and additionally, I think when you're dealing with uh, reports and senior leaders, you you have to make time somehow, even if it's like Zoom bingo or Zoom games. I recently was facilitating for a company that at the end of every week, they have a 30 minute, um, you know, guessing game that they play online where all of them do it together. And honestly, it was super fun to watch because you would think that was silly you actually get to see different aspects of people's personalities. You get to see how they show up in a lighthearted, fun, but competitive situation. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that is critical and companies need to stay creative. And this kind of, oh, that doesn't add to the bottom line mentality is going to get very expensive for them. Mm, mm. Well, that being said, and they may not have really internalized that aspect of it yet, you know, how can on both sides, you know, the the employer as well as the employees see the the value in that? Because I'm I'm thinking in my head of like the working moms who are like juggling, taking the kids to school, getting the project done and being like, okay, just give me the thing I have to do. This feels like fluff. Right. And so how is it that, you know, you're able to uh, really let not only the uh, employees and consultants and as well as the business owners know how important this actually is? I think that is such a great question, Diane, because I agree. And especially even just like left brain determined people, they're like, this has nothing to do with the deliverable. Why are you asking me to do that? I'm doing a great job. But I think as people, we get so focused on the end goal and just getting it all done. We forget how delicious that zing of connection is, how that playfulness adds to the value of our life. And I think the employees have to be reminded that at the end of the day, this is good for team building. This is good for showing up. This is good for promotion. This is good for corporate awareness of your different interpersonal skills. And if you don't show up as your full self and you're just doing one aspect of your your job, you're you're missing out and the company is missing out. So it's got to be a top down. You have to have leaders who are participating and underscoring how important it is to be seen as 360 humans when, you know, we're living in this two-dimensional world, right? Like, just like you and I are chatting right now, we have to be more than that. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure your background, um, which is very varied, I might add, you know, would have some interesting thoughts. So feel free to weigh in. Cause I think it's, I, I think it's critical, but I do agree with you. It's challenging to get people to realize that 30 minutes is not soft. It's it's right. really important. Yeah. You know, it's funny, you know, that you mentioned that because uh, it was kind of circling a little bit in my head is, you know, when you do the undercover work that I did, you're kind of in, a, in an, an alternate reality of how you're looking at things. And when you live an undercover life, I believe that that everyone has some aspect of themselves that's undercover. They hope they don't get found out. Sometimes it's imposter syndrome. It's it's like, you know, they don't want to be found out that maybe they don't know what they think that they know. And so there's a lot of different aspects to that. And I think that it might actually feel a little scary for people to share the things that um, if they say like, hey, I've got a sick child or, you know, my marriage isn't doing well or, you know, I my health just you know, got thrown out the door in the last two years because I haven't gotten my, you know, ass out of my chair kind of thing. You know, all the kind of things that that people don't necessarily want people to know about those nitty gritty, but it's also the things that make people real. So I think creating a safe environment that people can say, hey, you know, I'm not going to be judged for the craziness that maybe is going on around me 
with all that happening, I'm still showing up. I'm still doing the best I can. And how can we support each other in that? And I think that people uh, can really uh, respect the reality of that and, and what that actually looks like. So I think uh, it actually gives an opportunity for people to be real. And I think what happens is that the the leader has to sometimes be that first person that, that shares some of those things. And I, there's kind of... Um, Oh, how would I even say this? I think that there is a um, a fine line between some professionalism and not having it be, um, you know, gossip hour as well. You know, so it's it's kind of a like I said, it's a fine line of sharing who you are, being real, having people create a safe environment, but also not taking away from you know the forward direction of, of the company and the objectives and the goals that are happening too. So I think it's probably different for for each company as far as uh, how they weigh in on those things. Yeah. And I, I absolutely agree and echo that leaders have to be the first ones taking that vulnerable step. But I also don't necessarily think you would do any of that in a public forum. I think the moment for that sort of thing is there has to be more one-on-ones. There has to be more checking in. And from the interviews that I've conducted with the companies that I work with, generally speaking, a lot of these managers, they're so busy, they don't want to do a one-on-one, even if it's 10 minutes. But that 10 minutes once a week makes people feel seen and heard. And in a one-on-one situation, Diane, I think if you're saying something about your health or your wife's health or your kid's health or your partner's health, right? Like, I think that is going to be seen as more confidential, especially if the manager says, listen, this 10 minutes is a confidential exchange. I want to check in with you holistically. You know, you're doing fine with the deliverables. I see blah, 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 right? What's going on in your world? And then they actually take notes. They take notes because they want to be able to follow up the next week. And at the end of the day, we're all so busy, right? We're all juggling so much. You're not going to remember, you know, this, that, or the other thing. But I think publicly, you know, when you're doing games or something. I think showing up as your full self and showing up enthused and energetic and yes, probably not vulnerable forward is still the way it's going to work in corporate America because we we have to be supportive and encouraging of the company's mission. Yeah. You know, and nobody wants to be like, oh, she's phoning it in because she has a sick cat. And yet that moment exists. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it's it's important to look at that that holistic aspect of it, and you know, uh, keeping that in mind, you have a kind of a unique experience uh, in your past, and one of the reasons I love this question uh, is that we never know what we're going to get around disempowerment and empowerment, and it's funny how. A lot of people not sure how they're going to answer it, but how they answer it is is perfect. And I'd love for you to share you had a, a 10 year relationship and you actually had to go through a lawsuit as well as a breakup. And so that's taking two very stressful situations, uh, very life changing situations. And not only would I like you to just share that experience, but how that helps shape you in connection, because the fact that you stand for connection and went through something that broke connection, I think that those kind of experiences really build our expertise in what works and what doesn't work. Yeah, I I think that that is spot on, Diane. Thank you. Yeah, it was was a very interesting thing. I got out of um, a relationship that was actually 13 years long. And I had in what I sort of consider sort of classic female manner had not really followed through on getting all my partnership documents done with this person. And we were both in business and in partnership, like a couple. And so there was a question of who should get what. So he decided that he would take me to court, which was interesting because I thought there would have been an amicable way to settle this, but he had a very different vision of how he should be valued for his time over the past 13 years. And it was shocking and interesting and awful because I think you shut down as a person. It was the first time 
I'd ever been sued. And, you know, you're like, oh my God, I'm getting sued. I was very lucky that I had a, a very good friend at the time who was, who'd been through tons of lawsuits, who was very supportive and he gave great advice. But at the same time, you know, you're watching this person that you were with for 13 years completely do an about face, which is, is crushing. And I think it's in that crushingness and in that separation of connection that I realized how important connection and clarity is. Right. And so it's funny because the relationship that I went through after that one, um, disintegrated and it was while it was disintegrating that I finished my book, which is called the big power of tiny connections. And it was, it, it was, it was sort of jarring because at one point I thought, Oh, this book is great because it aligns with my relationship. And then when the relationship broke up, thanks to COVID and us not being aligned on where we wanted to go in life, I realized it just cements the idea that humans, the most, that literally for humans, the most powerful thing we can do to move ourselves and our lives and our visions forward is to connect with the world around us. And it's, small things, it's big things, but whatever you want to get out of life, you're going to get it faster, better, bigger when you connect with the world around you. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's interesting to see that, um, you know, I think when people are just doing their day to day, uh, there's some things that people take for granted. There's things that they aren't necessarily, you know, looking at. Um, and so the, it's always interesting, like when you look at the timing of your book, you know, um, what are some things that have evolved since then? I mean, this year you mentioned it, it's uh, the big power of tiny connections, uh, which, you know, for people to know, it's, it's an Amazon bestseller. It's a gold prize, gold book award winner. I mean, there's a lot of great things about this book, you know, so congratulations on that. Um, tell us about why is this book important and what has changed since you wrote it um, that uh, some kind of insights, because I think even just writing a book is uh, a growth period as well, just because there's so much you pour into yourself and so many ahas that you have. Yeah. And it's interesting. The first pass of the book, I finished in the end of December, 2020. And then I hired the development editor team and they came in and I completely, with their support and direction, rewrote the book in the beginning of last year. So I rewrote it and had it done by the middle of February. And then I went through this very traumatic breakup all year long. <laughs> and so I didn't get back to the book and doing my final edits and working with the final copywriter, copy editors, sorry, um, and the proofreaders and the designers until October, November. So the good news was, is in that time, I was able to look at how could I make this book more supportive? How could I offer, you know, top seven tips. Like if you go to jennash.com, there's a banner, which I talk about in the book and it's like, grab my free tips, you know, for free, just because I'm like, what are the things we need to know as we move through life? Some people know them innately. Some people struggle. It's, it's been really interesting to talk to people because they're like, oh, so it's a book for introverts. And I'm like, no, it's a book for pretty much anyone. And that's why it's, it's structured in a very snackable way. Each chapter, could be read just alone. Each chapter tells a story about different things that we want. Maybe you want to make more money or want a better job or want to get invited to more parties. Like whatever human curiosity or need, the book is structured around that need because at the end of the day, our connections facilitate leaning into that. And so for me, what changed was awareness of just how do I make this really easy, really snackable? Because again, people are getting more disconnected. So I think, you know, because life is getting faster in a weird way, we're being more focused and more productive in our zoom worlds or teams worlds. Um, hello, Microsoft. And, um, so one of the things I did, for instance, was I added a what's the point at the end of every chapter so that you could just read that and you'd get the whole chapter. Mm -hmm. I added sections about stories. Let me tell you a story so that I 
illustrate what I'm trying to say. And they're all interviews with people who've been through that specific example or their examples from my life. And so in my life, I evolved, I shifted my coaching and my training business um, more closely around connection as the book was about to come out because I was doing it, but not quite as focused. So in a way, you're right, the book helped me gain greater, greater clarity around how I wanted to show up and support the companies and people around me. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I think that the the more we move forward and we get clear on on uh, the things that light us up, the things that are our passions, and, and we lean into that, our life experience steps in and supports us in that as well. Um, and I know that uh, a lot of uh, the people that you coach are uh, female executives in the STEM, in the STEM world. And um, I'm curious, do you have a coach yourself? And how has that evolved over time? Absolutely. I'm a firm believer that coaches need coaches. Um, I have been very blessed to be working with the same coach. Um, he is currently not taking new clients and I don't, yeah. So he, he's kind of on the DL, but he's been a coach, uh, for five years and he ran companies very successfully for 20 years prior to that. So he is, um, a very well established executive coach. And I also have a couple of reciprocal coaches who are women. I tend to work primarily with women. It's interesting that my prime primary coach is a man. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I find coaching relationships where you're giving and receiving is also a really interesting way to extend your abilities. Right, right. Uh, you know, do you have a coach? Oh, I do. I have, I have several coaches in different areas of my life too. So I think that it's important to, uh, especially if you have a goal and you have that accountability, it always reminds me of the, of the quote from Les Brown, whereas you can't see the bigger picture when you're in the frame, right? Because when you're in it, you may be missing things. It's that peripheral vision and things that, that you look at. So for me, I feel like you can, uh, and I think this is a trap sometimes I think coaches get into is that we know the mechanics of things, we know what needs to be done, but we don't necessarily see the things that the thing you don't see, right? And you can't necessarily act on the thing that you don't have even the awareness that it's there, that it's in the spot. And I think it's only when you talk through some of those things. Um, I think in some ways, uh, the podcast helps people self-coach in, in, you know, in questions that we bring up, there's things that people are like, well, I never thought of it that way, or I, I didn't know how this applied to my life. And, and hopefully you all out there are asking yourself some of these deeper questions. And then you may ask yourself too, like, okay, well, maybe I do need to have some support with this. It's like knowing it's one thing, but implementing it is, is a completely different, different aspect of it. So I think it's important to have people in, you know, your inner circle, whether that's a formal coach or someone who maybe you do an exchange uh, with them where you're like, Hey, I'm thinking about doing this. I don't, I don't know how it's going to affect all the other things I'm looking at. And so I think it's really important to have that. And I think that's part of the danger, I think that we've seen in the last couple of years uh, with you know lockdowns and people working from home is the isolation and people not having people they can just reach out readily to. So people have to be a lot more proactive um, with that in, in what they're creating. And so people are spending more time alone, more in their home, and they have to actively look for those connections. They actively have to create uh, a social life and people have gotten used to doing work in their pajamas and, you know, not really having to, you know, go outside of that bubble, which reminds me, one of the things I always love to ask uh, my guests is I think we have different experiences in our home and we act differently in our bedroom versus our office or our kitchen. So what is your favorite room in your home and why? Oh, my favorite room in my home would definitely be my bedroom. Cause I feel like the minute you get into bed, you're just like, an exhale. And, you know, when you have, when you have nice sheets and nice pillows, you're just like, ah, bed, there's definitely a, a happiness factor. Plus my bedroom's like filled with sunlight, which is a rarity in New York city, which is where I'm based. Um, so that's always lovely. Yeah. What's your favorite room? I've my bedroom for sure. 
You know, I, I similarly where I think it's just like my sanctuary where I can just unplug. Um, I'm currently making an effort because I started getting into the habit of of looking at my phone, like right up until bedtime, even if I was looking at a book. And so I make a point of having a non-electronic book and having non-electronics in my space because I really do think that makes a difference on how much you can unplug and relax. And I think it's uh, that's definitely an addiction I think people have had is like, you know, having within arm's length, you know, some sort of, of device. And I think that breaks down connection, right? You know, and so especially when you're, you know, if you have a partner who's right next to you, instead of having that conversation, you know, people are on those devices together, you're not really having real connection. So for me, creating that sacred space um, in my room uh, really helps me, you know, differentiate have the boundary of, of work and other aspects and, and create that safe space. And I think everyone, you know, even if it's a closet, like you need to have your own space somewhere um, where you live to support yourself. Yeah. I think a powerful idea that I have tried that works really well is um, doing no tech chunks of time at night. So from seven to 10, you don't do any tech in your home. So your partner and you are not on your phones. You're not on your computers. You know, if you're going to watch a movie together, that could be like an exception or playing music. Sometimes you're, you have to look at your phone to play the music. But the other option is um, I could I could never talk uh, a partner into this, but a friend of mine has a, uh, a tech Shabbat. So Friday, and it's interesting, she's not Jewish, but she, <laughs> she, and, her, she and her partner don't do technology from sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday. They just take a whole day. And, and she, yeah, she thinks it's been relationship enhancing to an nth degree. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I think that there should at least be, uh, you know, if you can't do that on, on a weekly basis, I think, you know, monthly or at least quarterly where you have a day that you unplug. I mean, that's kind of where uh, Sundays came from, a day of worship of where, you know, you completely shut off from the rest of the world, having a day of rest, right? A day where you got to reflect, you got to restore, you got to do those kind of things. I think that we've gotten away from that uh, in our society to be able to have those delineations. Um, we have have uh, one of our our friends and coaches, uh, Todd Durkin, talks about having uh, your your the end of your day of a three two one. So three hours before you go to bed, you stop eating. Uh, two hours before you go to bed, you stop doing work, and an hour before you go to bed, you stop doing electronics. And so, kind of having that consistency of your your winding down to allow yourself to have like uh, more of that break and separation between the busyness of of life and and being able to go to a place where you can have good sleep and you can really recharge yourself because I think people um, kind of uh, think of that as not being as important. And I think that if you really look at um, what are the, the habits that really allow you to be successful, you know, having some boundaries around those things makes sense. Absolutely. And it's interesting. So many of the sessions that I have, even with my executive clients, end up being around they would do a better job if they were better rested. So looking at, you know, how they're showing up for themselves in their lives and how they're holding boundaries. Yeah, no, it, it, it makes an absolute difference. So uh, I know that our, our uh, listeners are going to want to stay in contact with you. Um, how can they best do that? Uh, jennifernash.com or sorry, jennash.com. <laughs> I used to have jennifernash.com. <laughs> Jen, Jen Nash.com, nice and short, or I'm on Instagram, real Jen Nash, nice and easy again. Um, and I would uh, love to hear from anybody who reaches out. Perfect. Sounds good. And you know that uh, our uh, theme for this uh, season is freedom fighters. And uh, I know that, uh, you know, one of the ways that you fight for freedom is supporting initiatives for foster kids. And I'd love to know a little bit more about uh, how you became passionate about that aspect of supporting children. Uh, believe it or not, a friend of mine from high school was a foster parent to in this charity called Foster Pride, which is run by an amazing woman, Lynn. And Lynn does this wonderful after school program where kids are mentored, tutored, and given 
crafting assignments, which they can sell. So they're supported to economically in a whole different way than you would expect. And having this mentorship in their lives supports these kids dramatically. And every year when I, when I hear the updates about what's been going on with Foster Pride, I'm so impressed because they, they literally help kids graduate and get into college and graduate from college because they're changing, you know, I guess the narration that these kids hear, which is very challenging. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that is that is great to hear. I know that uh, there's a lot of challenging in the foster world and just, you know, kids in general. And we do a lot of things to bring awareness and support uh, anywhere from from trafficking to, uh, you know, kids not being supported. And so I think it's uh, one of the things I think in our society that we need to bring more attention to is how do we uh, support and foster children to be independent, you know, adults to be able to to have that uh, that worthiness that they have, and we see such a difference in the kids that have that support versus those that don't. And I think the more we spend some attention um, on our children as society, I mean, they they have said for years it takes a village, right? It takes all of us. So thank you for that support that that you are doing. Um, these are the kind of ripple things that make a difference in in a child's life. Yeah, I completely concur, and it's so it's so impressive when you interview and meet with the kids who've literally gone through Lynn's program and they tell you the stories of how having that one person show up for them, connect with them and believe in them, change the course of their lives. It's amazing. So yeah. And thank you for your support because it sounds like you do a lot in that realm. Well, we all we all need to do our part. So absolutely. This is this is the community or the community that we want to grow is that, you know, when people get awareness of like, you know, people maybe never heard of, of that before and they get to now look into ways that they can support in their own community. I think the difference is that you've done the extra step of actually meeting these kids and actually seeing what they're doing. And I know there's people that do uh, donations, but they don't actually ever get to see the kids or what they're doing. And so they don't actually know where their money's going and if it's having true impact. So I think the more we get involved in those kind of things makes a really big difference. So those thank you again for, for sharing your path and your wisdom and all the great things you're up to. Thank you so much, Diane. Lovely meeting you. Thank you. You as well. And to our listeners out there, thank you for being here and sharing your time with us. And until we connect again, live your spa life. Bye for now. Bye-bye.